afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, and welcome to this uh, book launch of the fifth edition of Maritime Law, uh, a book that has been edited uh, by Professor Bartz uh, since its uh, first edition in 2008. Um, we are very happy to have with us today um, uh, three of the uh, contributors to this book, including Professor Bartz, who's an honorary professor at the Centre for Commercial Law Studies um, at Queen Mary University of London, and uh, my hugely valuable and esteemed colleague uh, in the institute uh, um, that we have at CCLS, the Insurance, Shipping and Aviation Law Institute. Um, we, we are very happy to uh, welcome you today um, to uh, this event, which celebrates the fifth edition of this book that is um, uh, very well loved among our students. Um, and uh, I'm, as the director of the Insurance, Shipping and Aviation Law Institute, um, it's my uh, um, pleasure to welcome you. I would like to introduce the uh, chair of today's proceedings, the, the moderator, Professor Sir Bernard Ricks, also a professor at CCLS. Um, Professor Ricks uh, retired from the Court of Appeal uh, in 2013 um, after 20 years as a judge, first in the High Court of England and Wales and subsequently in the Court of Appeal. He now um, uh, has a, a practice as an arbitrator and me mediator and um, he also is a professor with us and uh, very well loved by our students um, to whom he offers courses on a, a variety of commercial law topics, including shipping and insurance. Um, so, uh, Bernard, I will hand over to you now to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much indeed, Miriam. Um, well, I am really enormously pleased to have been invited to moderate this session. Uh, Maritime Law is a terrific book. I mean, it's coming, it's now launching its fifth edition, having first seen uh, its life in as recently as 2008. Um, it's certainly beloved of our students at CCLS, but it's also a hugely important vadi mecum to uh, all kinds of shipping professionals, solicitors and barristers and claims handlers uh, and professionals of, of all kind who find in it uh, a hugely helpful and broad uh, uh, um, co coverage of all kinds of shipping problems. Um, raising, as one can see, everything from the building of ships to, of course, charters and bills and lading, but also passengers and, and public international aspects, safety, compliance, pollution, and, of course, marine insurance. Perhaps it should have a chapter on litigation, arbitration, and mediation, but I'm not volunteering. Um, anyway, we have three of its... Uh, uh, authors with us today, uh, Professor, Professor Bartz, of whom Miriam has already spoken, uh, perhaps the Fonza de Rigo of, of this work when, when she was director of, of the um, Institute at, at Southampton University. Uh, uh, Yvonne uh, has had uh, both a practical background as a shipping solicitor and also, of course, a hugely important academic role in the promotion of shipping law in this country. And we're thrilled to have her as an honorary professor uh, at CCLS uh, in these days. And she's speaking from her home in the Hampshire countryside. Uh, then, then we have Professor uh, Michael or Mikis Simplis, who is joining us all the way from Hong Kong. Um, I should have said that uh, Professor Bartz is going to speak on the impact of Brexit on maritime conflict. She might have said the impact of conflict on maritime conflict, but there we are. Let's hope for better, better things in the next coming days. Um, 
Uh, uh, professor Simplis uh, is professor uh, in uh, Hong Kong um, at the City University of Hong Kong, and uh, he uh, was a deputy director at the Southampton um, Marine Institute in his day, and he is a great expert on um, all matters of uh, autonomous ships, sea traffic management, climate change, environment. And he is going to speak uh, to us um, well on a variety of topics, technology, environment, IMO and regulation, but we could call his, um, his participation as change in the future. And then we have Professor Filippo Lorenzon, who is speaking to us from Venice. Uh, and he is um, a professor uh, in China at Dalian uh, Maritime University. Uh, and um, he has also had his connection with Southampton. He is a qualified lawyer, not only in, in Britain, but also in Italy. Uh, and he is going to sp uh, speak on the subject of COVID and after COVID. And if one stops to think for a moment uh, how the world has continued to operate as best it can during this year of COVID, one must, I think, pay tribute to the way that the ships have continued to travel uh, between the nations of the world and to supply the nations of the world with all that they need. The aeroplanes have almost stopped running or have been prevented by many countries from, from, from running, but the ships are keeping us going. Well, with that brief introduction um, and my renewed thanks for being your moderator today, let me begin by calling on Professor uh, Bartz uh, to speak on the impact of Brexit on maritime conflict. Professor Bartz. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, uh, both Miriam and Bernard. I'm extremely grateful for those comments today, and I'm again extremely grateful to uh, Miriam Bowlby for organising this event. The impact of Brexit on maritime conflict of laws. And I wanted to start uh, just uh, with um, a, a brief uh, comment on the purpose of this book. I should say, I must give credit right at the start. Initially, this book was the brainchild of Charles Davis at Southampton University. And we all work together as a team. And I think that's what in, has enabled us to give such a wide coverage in this book. Because initially, there were 10 authors, there are now nine, and it has been possible to cover a very wide range of topics because there are so many and every three years, because each of us just had the bit that we really knew a lot about, and um, it has been uh, fantastic to be able to take in to account uh, all the new developments uh, in marriage challenges, and it is only one, but one of the challenges of writing the first edition was Brexit. When I first agreed to do the fifth edition, we had no idea what was going on with withdrawal. Indeed, they were very turbulent. Uh, as I would uh, started writing my Charter Parties chapter, we got... Um, the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union as of the 31st of January 2020. This was pretty late in the day, considering we had to submit the fifth edition by the end of March. Um, for this fifth edition, um, much EU legislation is still applicable uh, because it's retained legislation and continues to apply during the transition period, but that transition period ends at 11 p.m. on 31st December 2020. As of today, 
We have 23 days to go until the end of the transition period, and we're somewhat still in a state of uncertainty. On 20th of September 2020, Peter Hardwick, the trade policy advisor at the British Meat of Processors Association, also known as Boris Johnson, our prime minister, who'd said that he was going to make a titanic success of Brexit. Does Mr. Alvin Reddy know what became of the Titanic? I certainly is ideal. Mr. Alvin Reddy is in Brussels today. So far, we have no deal, but we await to see the outcome of his dinner uh, in, in Brussels tonight. What is certain is that jurisdiction will not be resolved tonight or indeed before the end of the transition period because civil justice, including private international law, is not even on the food fishing rights competition and enforcement of any deal, but nothing on jurisdiction. So the first chapter of the book, which I wrote, is on conflict of laws. And why does it come first? At the outset of any maritime dispute, or indeed any uh, international dispute, it's imperative to determine the law applicable to the dispute, which tribunal, whether arbitration or court, has jurisdiction to decide this dispute, and also to consider time bars and security. Mickey Simplis deals with security uh, in uh, maritime matters in chapter 12. There will be no change or no substantive change brought about by Brexit to applicable law because nations, Rome 1 and Rome 2, deal with applicable law and they will, those rules will continue to apply after the transition period ends. Not only will the EU member states apply those rules, but we will too. So no change there. But there will be changes to jurisdiction. Brexit does change the position on jurisdiction. And maritime contracts often provide for English jurisdiction. There may well be an express choice of English law. Three types of maritime contract where English jurisdiction clauses are very commonly used. Ship finance contracts, bills of lading and marine insurance. And we'll look at what the position is now, the transition period until the end of this year, but then what it is going to be and what it may become. Currently, the position Article 25 of the recast regulation, uh, European uh, regulation on jurisdiction, that currently applies, but will no longer apply after the transition period ends convention. And the United Kingdom has applied um, to uh, accede to that convention in its own right at the end of the transition period. Iceland, Norway and Switzerland have said that they will support such a request by the United Kingdom but it also requires the consent of the EU and Denmark. And as I say, at the moment, that's not even under discussion. Or it may be under discussion, but it will certainly not be resolved by the end of the transition period at the end of this year. We also have the 2005 Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. Initially, this was um, agreed by the European Union on behalf of all EU member states, including the United Now, uh, um, acceded to that convention in our own right. We did that on the 28th of September 2020, and that will come into force on the 1st of January 2021. And then, of course, we also have our common law rules, um, and I'll say a little bit more about those further on. 
So let's turn to our three maritime contracts and see um, how uh, each of them will be dealt with, how they're currently dealt with and how they will be dealt with after the transition period. The first thing is ship finance. At present, the EU regulations on jurisdiction apply to ship finance agreements and marine insurance contracts. Ship finance agreements usually provide for asymmetric jurisdiction clauses, which typically provide that if the borrower brings proceedings, it may only do so in England, whereas the bank may bring proceedings against the borrower in any competent court. One of the questions that arises is whether an asymmetric jurisdiction clause is an exclusive jurisdiction clause and the English courts have held that it is, most recently, in a decision called Etihad, and um, therefore that the EU regulations apply to asymmetric jurisdiction. We've got a valid asymmetric jurisdiction agreement, which is an exclusive jurisdiction agreement. The court chosen shall have jurisdiction, and any other court must stay its proceedings even if the English court chosen is second seized. The recast regulations also apply to bills of lading. Uh, we look at the position as between the original carrier and the shipper. And once the bill of lading is transferred to a third party, we then turn to national law uh, to see whether third party consignee or indoor sea is bound by the exclusive jurisdiction clause if it was found to be valid as between the two original parties. Third party consignee or indoor seat is bound under the uh, Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1992 or is almost always bound. Um, the recast regulation also applies to marine insurance contracts, although the regulation has special rules about insurance contracts. Um, nevertheless, uh, there's um, uh, special provisions in relation to certain types of insurance, such as marine insurance, and uh, we can have an exclusive jurisdiction agreement in a marine insurance contract exclusive jurisdiction agreement binding a victim of insured damage who brings a direct action against the liability insurer and that was decided of the court of justice of the european union under the 2007 lugano convention again uh, we would, uh, that would apply to ship finance agreements, including asymmetric agreements. It would apply to bills of lading and marine insurance contracts. The big difference, though, with the 2007 Lugano Convention is that there is no exception. In the and if the English court chosen is second seized, it would have to stay its proceedings until the court first seized has established whether it has jurisdiction. This, in my view, is a major disadvantage of the 2007 Lugano Convention, and I was delighted when that particular problem was reformed by the recast regulation. If we just turn to the, that convention um, doesn't apply to all types of maritime contracts. If I come on to what the convention does, it, uh, it, it, party autonomy is at heart of the convention. And if the parties have chosen an exclusive court jurisdiction agreement, that choice shall be given effect to uh, and that's Article 5, um, and any judgment that is given by that court will be recognised and enforced by the other contracting states to the Convention. But 
there's much doubt as to whether the 2005 Hague Convention would apply to asymmetric jurisdiction clauses in ship finance contracts. It doesn't apply at all to bills of lading, and that's clear from Article 22F of the Hague Convention. It does apply to marine insurance contracts as a result of various declarations which have been made both by the European Union when it acceded to the Convention and also now by the United Kingdom when it acceded on the 28th of September 2020. The Hague Convention doesn't have any provisions on subrogation or direct action, unlike the uh, recast regulation, and therefore we have to turn to our national law to answer questions about uh, subrogation direct action. If I also just mention the common law position, uh, under our common law rules, we would enforce a jurisdiction agreement in a ship finance agreement, whether asymmetric contract. So I've just set out there the position as it is at the moment until the transition period ends. Position B, after it ends, at 11 p.m. on 31st December 2020. In relation to ship finance contracts, uh, we no longer will have the recast regulation in the 2007 Lugano Convention. The 2005 Hague Convention will apply to ship finance contracts, but much doubt as to whether they apply to asymmetric jurisdiction clauses. But at common law, such an agreement would be valid in the English courts, but would it bind the courts of other EU member states or other uh, Lugano contracting states? Could we enforce any English judgment um, uh, without the benefit of the recast regulation or 2007 Lugano Convention or Hague Convention if it doesn't apply to asymmetric jurisdiction clauses? As regards bills of lading, after um, the end of the transition period, again, they would apply. The 2005 Hague Convention does not apply because the bills of lading fall outside its scope. Therefore, the common law rules will apply to bills of lading. And the English court will uphold an exclusive English jurisdiction clause in the bill of lading and it will be binding on a third party consignee or indoor sea. But this is subject to a discretion, the decision of the House of Lords in Donoghue and Armco. Uh, and if the English court gives a judgment, can we enforce that English judgment in other EU member states or Lugano contracting states? The position when the transition period comes to an end in relation to marine insurance. Uh, again, the recast regulation and the 2005 Lugano conventions will not apply. That an exclusive English jurisdiction of clause um, is not binding in a direct action will no longer apply. And <laughs> English insurers may be very glad and will apply to marine insurance contracts. Um, but no provisions on direct action. So the English courts will apply their national law, the, the common law rules, to such issues. It may be that arbitration will become even more popular to make sure that Athens does not apply, because Athens doesn't apply to arbitration. The 2007 Lugano Convention will not apply as at the 1st of January 2021, but it's to be hoped, or I think the, the game plan is, that we would like to have the 2005 Lugano Convention, but that may take some further time to achieve. 
if the United Kingdom is able to ratify the 2007 Lugano Convention, if they get consent from the EU and Denmark, then those rules in that convention would apply jurisdiction agreements, according to the English courts, to bills of lading and marine insurance contracts. The other Lugano contracting states have due regard to the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. But, as I've already mentioned, the 2007 Lugano Convention has major drawbacks because it doesn't have the equivalent of Article 31.2 of the recast regulation. Could the English court grant an anti-suit injunction if the 2005 Lugano Convention applies? No, but it could award damages for breach of the jurisdiction clause. So, in conclusion, the recast regulation and the 2005 Lugano Conventions will no longer apply from 11pm on the 31st of December 2020. The 2005 Hague Convention will apply to ship finance contracts but possibly not to asymmetric jurisdiction clauses, and it will apply to marine insurance contracts, but not to bills of lading, and therefore the common law rules will apply. There's uncertainty as to third party situations such as subrogation and direct action, and each contracting state will apply its national law, which may of course differ. If the EU agrees to the ratification of the 2007 Lugano Convention. That convention will apply to all three types of maritime contract, but there are significant drawbacks with that convention. So we do have more position that we have a convention and common law rules starting from the 1st of January. Uh, and possibly then 2007 Lugano Convention at some later date. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Yvonne. Thank you. And I'm going to call on, on Professor Simplis to speak about change in the future. Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can do that properly. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's very good to see the names of many friends and uh, uh, ex and present students in the audience. Miriam, thank you very much for, for organizing this, uh, this event. It, it's really a pleasure uh, to see the faces of friends and colleagues uh, that I haven't seen since I've been in, in Hong Kong and we've been uh, stopped from traveling because of COVID. When we discussed the organization of this uh, particular event, we've uh, said we're going to talk about the future, and uh, but we didn't agree about the horizon of the future. So it, we didn't discuss the horizon. Yvonne talked about an imminent change brought about by a conscious or a conscious decision by a nation to change its rules. Um, Filippo is going to talk, I, I believe, from the photograph of coronavirus uh, that he, he, I saw him uh, have earlier about uh, COVID, uh, a natural um, event. And I'm going to talk about a combination of those, something that we have been bringing on ourselves and uh, how we can deal with that. And I've, I, I will talk about technology and environment and the way they are linked through the IMO regulation because I think this is the area that uh, the fifth, well, the sixth, the seventh, and perhaps the 50th edition of the book will, will have to focus uh, upon. And um, technology has already been challenging um, the shipping regulatory regime. It, uh, autonomous craft has already been used uh, for, for, for a long period of time in um, uh, by navies, by the offshore industry, and by by research institutions, and now there are companies who are trying to develop 
uh, or try autonomous uh, ships, although they don't uh, dare go far enough as removing the crew from them uh, yet. Technology is not only about navigating the ship, it is also about monitoring the ship. So we, we can have smart ships, we can have a continuous assessment of what the ship is doing and what the risks uh, that it faces um, are. And it's a matter of whether we want to use them. And we may have to use them because we have uh, big environmental challenges. We have been uh, degrading the marine environment, but also the atmospheric environment. And I think it's, it, it's time to go. And I think we will see declarations about uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, to be made. We are going to see um, claims about zero discharges from ships. And I would actually, I would personally suggest that we should go for zero environmental impact of shipping uh, collectively. Now, some of them may sound uh, too optimistic, but actually it's a matter of how you view things. Uh, for example, states, when they discuss the Paris Agreement, uh, they talk about zero greenhouse gas emissions, but they take into account emissions plus sinks. So one could argue that shipping can tomorrow uh, achieve zero greenhouse gas emissions by just funding the uh, development of sinks or the development of technology uh, and, and installations which actually are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in another part of, of our activities. Because the objective is not really to make shipping clean, it's to make the planet safe. So we can think outside this, if you want, silo of looking at shipping as something separate that has to be dealt in a particular uh, and single way. And I, I am a strong believer that technology can actually help us do that. But of course, it will take time and it needs investment to develop. And at the moment we have what I see as a major obstacle, the IMO regulatory regime. Now the IMO is, is a wonderful institution. It was developed after the Second World War to provide consultation to the new states that were established and they wanted to have national fleets. And it has done an exemplary job in, in doing that. It has actually managed also to evolve itself when itself when uh, the first uh, pollution, uh, rave pollution event happened and helped develop prototype liability uh, regimes that are the only examples of uh, liability regimes that operate globally and provide efficient compensation. So it's, I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to belittle it or, or say that it's, it's not a useful institution, but it, it, has been, it has been run on the basis of command and, con command and control regime, which is, of course, which puts the cost on, on the regulators, and on developing minimum standards. Uh, and, and these together do not provide any financial incentives for, for innovation in the industry. No ship owner in the, his right, on her right mind would invest on a new type of ship when they know that in order to make it work, they will have to get it through uh, four to six year, perhaps longer uh, process uh, through the IMO by the time uh, which the innovation would have already been um, not innovative anymore and will be available to everybody. Uh, the IMO has also done some bad deals in the sense of uh, adopting command and control regimes in ballast water and ship recycling and atmospheric pollution, which are not easy to control uh, and uh, they are not certain that they will improve the situation. So it, it, it's not the best institution for all purposes, although it has done a great job, as I've said, in some aspects. Um, when we're talking about technology, when we're talking about what we need in terms of technology to um, reduce the environmental impact. It must be, to an extent, experimental. There must be, there must be scope for um, the industry to experiment. And the industry, I think, has got the, 
uh, the message of that because in um, in January there was for the upcoming then uh, MEPC um, a proposal by the International Chamber of Shipping and other ship owning um, organizations to develop an international maritime research and development board. Uh, and this has again been up the shipping news on uh, the 16th of November 2020. So it means that the money is there. And this money is about 5 billion US dollars to accelerate decarbonization. So it is about technological development. Now, 5 billion it sounds like a large amount of, of money. Uh, it is over 10 years, so it's about 500 million per year. And on the right-hand side of my screen, I have tried to put this in, in monetary context. Well, um, you can calculate, we know, we know approximately how many um, million tons of greenhouse gases are emitted annually, and one can cost that either by using uh, what the Obama administration has costed um, the effect of greenhouse gas emissions are, which is $50 per ton, or the price for the ETS in Europe, which was much, much smaller. But it is something between 10 um, and $50 billion and annually. All right? And you can look also at the profits of shipping organizations um, during the pandemic, uh, Mars had uh, posted earnings for the third quarter, only for the third quarter of 2.3 billion uh, US dollars. And if you want to be more ambitious and see how much it costed to get the US to the moon, uh, it was 140 billion pounds, according to the BBC. So these are the numbers of 5 billion is quite a modest amount. What to me, it says is that the money is there. Uh, it, it, it's not a big problem. And if you take into account that this is a first offer, if you want, by the industry, there may be more money into account. Uh, and there is a recognition that there is a need for technological innovation. But what really puzzles me is why is it going through the IMO? Why don't you fund universities or organizations that can actually deliver uh, quickly, why does it have to go through this regulatory mechanism that takes away any competition? I, I don't understand that. And actually, there are some very nice comments by the OECD uh, on similar lines that point out that the way the money is going to be collected, which is by taxing, um, by, by adding a tax in, in bunker fuel, goes against the policies of many governments who actually support fossil fuels by not taxing them when they are used for shipping activities. So there is some conflict in there that needs to be resolved. And I think it, it, it must become rational and it must be uh, based on, on a market um, uh, assumption. But I think what we will be seeing when this, this goes uh, through or it's tidied up is that we will be uh, seeing incentives for higher standards and quicker adoption of technology. Uh, whether that's going to happen through the IMO, whether it's going to be, if you want, delegated in, uh, in terms of um, self-regulatory instruments through the classification societies, which I think it's, makes sense, it's more efficient, it, it's not clear. But I think this will, um, will come, will be part of the book in the future. The other thing that I think is unavoidable is that we will move into the continuous monitor of ship's behavior. There's no point in, in controlling ships at port and seeing whether the engines work very properly. You need to look at their emissions. You need to look at what they're doing where, at, where they are at sea. Uh, and, and I think smart ships uh, will not be only about uh, moving the cargo quickly. It will have to do, they will have to do with um, uh, management of, of the ship when uh, it is at sea. So I think that we're going to have a new balance and the new balance will free, I hope, um, the environmental performance or the potential environmental performance and make it part of the financial performance where states are going to give better rights of access and benefits to ship owners who are prepared to spend their money in developing new technology and applying that. And the IMO will be, if you want, reduced 
to providing minimum standards for entry into the market, but above that level, the market will be free to give the better uh, ships, the cleaner ships, uh, the more, if you want, socially responsible ship owners, the opportunity to be more successful. And I think that's where I stop and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for that. Uh, and now uh, I call on Professor Lorizon to speak about COVID and after COVID. Filippo. Here I am. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's indeed very, very good to see so many old friends and, and uh, so many ex-students and and some people I haven't seen for a long time. Um, I'm very grateful for that and for the chat we are having uh, to Professor Miriam Goldby. Uh, putting this up was her idea, which we enthusiastically accepted. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly grateful uh, to Sir Bernard Ricks for chairing this, but I am particularly grateful to Yvonne Bartz, who has done a terrific job uh, once again, for the fifth time, um, to to herd us, uh, which is a very difficult thing to do indeed. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for her endurance. Um, it's very difficult to herd uh, Professor Timplis, as you might have already uh, understood from his speech. Now, let me try and see whether... I can put this on screen. Yep. I am sharing screen, which is great. So what I'm going to talk about um, very briefly, I assure you, is updating, uh, the process of updating Maritime Law. I love Maritime Law. It's a great book. And the process of updating it is a terrific experience every time. And this time was more terrific than any other time because as you heard, we had Brexit. Uh, Mickey's had to deal with uh, uh, robots, uh, autonomy, um, ships without people on board. And uh, I was just doing my usual stuff, um, international trade, uh, ships sale and purchase, some finance, and it was all done and dusted when the bombshell came. As you heard from uh, the introduction, I work in China now. Uh, I live in the UK and uh, I travel very, very often to Italy where I am now. So I have seen the pandemic coming towards me very slowly. First, I couldn't go to work to China. Then... Uh, Italy was hit very badly, as you will remember, no doubt, and I couldn't go back home. And then finally, it was England, which wouldn't allow me to go uh, neither to work to China nor indeed uh, to work uh, to, see, uh, to see the family back home. And that was just at the time when we delivered the book. We didn't know what was about to happen. And I remember signing off the book and telling Yvonne, oh, we've done it one more time. And then at the same time where the pandemic was declared, and I started thinking, oh God, I haven't said anything about the pandemic in the book. This is already out of date. And we haven't even seen the proofs yet. And, but that is, uh, and I hope you will get the gist of, of what I'm saying when, when I finish. But Updating these books is actually a kind of a race. It's a kind of a processing and reprocessing information which should be basic. This is a textbook which is designed um, for students, for young practitioners, for people who are not very, very familiar with all aspects of maritime law. Maybe one, maybe two, but not everything. So um, it, it was very interesting what happened this time. I'm, I'm very briefly, what I'm going to say is talk a little bit about COVID because I have been looking at it very, very closely recently. Um, and there are uh, some issues which were, are dealt with in the book and well, should be dealt with in the book, but aren't yet 
they will be in the sixth edition, no doubt. Uh, not sure about the 50th edition. We may have graver problems by then. Well, that's the enemy. Um, we have plenty, but this is a big one, although it's pretty small. Um, I'm just sharing what I have seen happening um, and I'm sharing the way I actually use the book to deal with things I see happening. So I deal, one of my chapters is about international trade and I deal mostly with CIF and FOB contracts. Um, the day the pandemic was declared, well, the epidemic was declared in China, problems started to arise for CIF and FOB sellers and buyers alike. Well, the first thing which started to happen was goods were not ready for shipment. It's not very much the ships having problems at the beginning. It was that because some of the Chinese factories had to slow down or shut down in certain parts of China pretty quickly, um, then we had a shortage of cargo. And that meant uh, uh, I had personal experience of quite a lot of delayed shipment, delayed delivery, which is quite serious, a breach in CIF contracts. The supply chain was badly damaged, if not broken. For certain commodities, it was broken. Um, if you don't have one or two chips uh, in a phone, then you can't produce the phone. If you don't have a piece of uh, a, a, a wheel which goes into the engine, you can't actually finish the engine off. So orders start to backlog and pile up and the entire supply chain, which involves, of course, shipping, was uh, suffering pretty much indeed. But also other issues which are not physical, I've seen plenty of cases where we had delivery of documents being delayed. So for example, the bill of lading wasn't available because it wasn't signed physically by the master, but by some ship agency, which was prevented from going to the office and doing any work because it wasn't, the office wasn't accessible. We had severe problems in the oil industry where uh, there were no surveyors able to go on board uh, because the procedures were not there, because the surveyors were not there, um, because the bookings were all berserk. And, uh, and so nobody was available to issue certificates at loading. And certificates at loading are pretty important pieces of paper when it comes to um, CIF contracts. Things were funnily more complicated in FOB contracts, um, particularly because... In FOB contracts, which are the contracts where it is the buyer who organizes the carriage arrangements, so it is the buyer who organizes the ship to go and pick up the cargo, then if the buyer was from a different country, they, they often had to follow different rules uh, to keep the crew safe, and they often had to, um, to, to comply with multiple regulations to be able to go and get the vessel uh, to load the cargo. And often the regulations which were fine um, at the port of loading or under the flag, uh, at least in my experience, were not considered sufficient in some countries who decided to take a stronger approach against uh, this infectious disease. So what may have happened is that even if the seller had cargo ready for lifting, uh, the buyer was ready for lifting, but for some reason the ship wasn't making happy the uh, authority of the, the port authority of the place of loading. Then you had uh, another issue, the issue where the FOB contract delivery couldn't happen uh, because the cooperation between seller and buyer was cracked by uh, the, the, the COVID. And when I say COVID, I don't mean, uh, and I, I want to be very clear on this, I don't mean the actual virus. What I mean is the legislation which has been put in place to protect peoples from the virus. The virus itself has caused um, some issues, but not many, mostly 
uh, quarantine issues, but not many in international trade. What has caused the problems in international trade has been, of course, the legislation which has been put in place to prevent the virus from spreading. But CIF and FOB contracts, which are what I talk about in, in, in the book, uh, are not the only trade terms. And in fact, many of the other INCO terms have been affected, uh, particularly if you had a delivery term, a delivery at point term, for, exact, for example, and you could take the goods at the port of discharge, but the point of delivery was further. Well, that further wasn't as easy uh, to reach as it would usually be. Um, and that is notwithstanding the carriage of cargo has always been protected. So it's always been possible to move cargo along, but apparently some things in many places didn't go according to plan. Now, carriage is something I don't do um, in, uh, uh, in maritime law, but I do a lot of, and we have seen quite a lot of stuff happening in carriage too. For example, First, and I went just in order of what I was in contact with, um, delayed discharge under marine bills of lading. Now, some vessels had to change rotation of discharge ports, and that because they couldn't go to one place, they had to go to another first, hoping that things would change and to be able to discharge cargo um, at another place. Well, that may have amounted to deviation. Uh, they may have caused damages um, for delay. The, the, some cargo stayed on board for much longer than it would normally be because of the redirection of the vessel. Quite a few ships uh, have uh, refused to go to port uh, or to a particular port, which was affected particularly in the early days because they thought it was unsafe. So they did try to rely on the safe port warranty. And the way that pans out, of course, depends on the fact of the particular case. But it certainly was a problem, particularly to an FOB buyer who was sending the vessel to the place to load the cargo and getting a phone call from uh, the master or the agent or the manager of the vessel and saying, well, we're not going there because it is now too dangerous and we don't have rules to protect. We don't have um, a system, a device to protect our crew, which doesn't want to go. Um, so some of the cargo, which was already on a float, had to go somewhere else. So it was redirected. And that does uh, indeed cause problems uh, when it comes to additional costs, because it has to be then carried to the place of the original discharge. Quarantine um, was certainly one issue, not major as one would expect, because that is the natural outcome of a, a pandemic or an epidemic is you may have quarantine. But mercifully, there have been a few uh, famously on board, um, on board of uh, uh, cruise ships. But as far as, as uh, mariners are concerned in commercial vessels, it has been less than I certainly personally had expected. And again, delay in documents. I've seen a lot of delay in documentation with bills of lading not being available at discharge because sometimes they weren't available for loading either, which leaves issues like application of the Hague-Grisby rules, limitation of liability. Was there a bill of lading ever intended to be issued? Again, it depends on the facts of the particular case, but these are problems which did materialize as a consequence of the pandemic, which wouldn't necessarily be uh, connected to a pandemic. It just was the effect of the restrictive legislation which was put in place to protect uh, countries, regions and continents from the pandemic. And phytosanitary just, just happened uh, a, a few weeks ago, it was a, a problem with the impossibility to do phytosanitary certification, which I thought was very odd uh, at a time that so much was given to, um, to this sort of institutions taking care of that. 
And that is not it, because a lot of issues also happened uh, when it came to accessing the goods. So goods may have been discharged, they could have been collected, but they wouldn't be accessible because the port was in isolation, because the place was not accessible, because they couldn't be picked up and taken away. That, of course, causes other issues like, well, if I can't expect the goods um, immediately after delivery or immediately uh, or, or three days after, if I can't have access to them, how can I know uh, who's going to pay the terminal charges, which in some cases have been amounting to quite a lot of money. And, and I also had inquiries about time bars. Uh, when is the day of discharge? the day of delivery uh, to counting time bar. If they can't actually get to the cargo and take any delivery or even look at it. Now, of course, Mickey's will say, because I can read his mind, although we are at a distance, that if all this was automated, we wouldn't have had any problems because mercifully, um, you know, machines are not subject to this kind of virus. They do have, however, some sensitivity to other viruses, don't they? Well, having said, oh, why doesn't this work? Here it is. So if, yeah, so if you hope to find the answer to all of these issues in the book, well, I'm afraid you don't. Uh, you don't find them, you won't find them. You probably find some of it in the next edition. And I assure you, at least in my chapter. But the point I wanted to make is this. That maritime law's primary pur purpose is to give a bird's eye view of maritime law to non-specialists and is a teaching tool. As far as I am concerned, but I'm, sh I'm sure my colleagues will agree on that, uh, it is designed to give the reader the opportunity to develop a method, a structure, a mental structure to use for solving problems don't necessarily need to be there already resolved for you. I use a lot maritime law, uh, even in the chapters I have written, to try and find solutions to problems they're not dealt with in that particular book. The world moves on dramatically fast, as we have seen. Policies change, the law follows, and the method must adapt. So I agree with Mikis that there will be a 50th edition of maritime law, hopefully I will be still writing it. Uh, and there is a need of a new edition because of this development, but the method has to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Filippo. Now I need to take this off screen, do I? Mm. Let me try. Yes. All Stop right. Share. Yeah. Well, now we have, uh, reached a, a time when we can uh, raise some questions um, and uh, we have a question um, which is addressed to Professor Bartz um, and which is as follows. The presentation was based on the premise of successful accession to the Lugano Convention. What if that endeavor fails? Could Professor Bartz provide a few comments on a plan B scenario? Also, is Professor Bartz privy to the recommendations made by the special panel formed by the government for that purpose? Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, actually, the presentation isn't on the premise that we have the 2007 Lugano Convention. Um, what I've done is, first of all, deal with the position as I believe it will be, as from 11 p.m. on the 31st of December, which is that we will not yet have um, the, we will not yet be a party to the Lugano Convention. We may be in time, but I suspect that's partly a political decision. So actually, as of 11pm uh, on the 31st of December, the end of the transition period, we will have, as between the EU member states, um, the Hague 
um, convention on choice of court agreements uh, and our common law rules. And the weird thing is that we may have that for a bit and then we have the 2007 Lugano Convention. Um, so um, we're not going to have it immediately. That, that much I think is, is uh, very clear. Thank you, Ben. The, the second part of the question um, was in relation to the current negotiations going on with the ju Judicial Committee. I'm afraid I'm not privy to those, so I can't really add. I don't know whether anyone else uh, has been party to do that. Apparently not. Um, I think that uh, Trevor Hartley uh, will may well be speaking about that. Professor Trevor Hartley may well be speaking about that. And I know that uh, Professor Paul Beaumont at Stirling University is privy to many of the Hague Conference discussions and the Lugano um, Convention discussions. But at the moment, I, I don't think there's anything clear on that. Thank you very much indeed, Yvonne. I should have said that that question came from Professor George Theocarides uh, from the World Maritime University in Malmo, <laughs> um, which I had the pleasure of visiting just before lockdown. I didn't know at the time just how, how by the skin of my teeth I got there and back. Um, anyway, we have another question from Jennifer Lavelle, who I think presents uh, herself as part of the LLM CCLS intake of 2008-2009. She, she says that they send their best wishes to the, to the panel, which is nice. And Oh, Bernard, it was the Southampton intake. The Southampton intake. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Miriam. Yes, um, uh, uh, Dr. Lavelle is well known to CCLS. She taught our students a few years ago. Um, so, so she's... Uh, She's very well loved at CCLS as well. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. <laughs> Thank you for putting me right, Dr. Lavelle. There we are. Anyway, um, Jennifer Lavelle has this question. What is next? Autonomous ships, Brexit, COVID, what's next? Perhaps electronic bills of lading, Miriam, uh, will become the norm quicker than expected. So that's the question. Um, I definitely think that we're incredibly fortunate to have Miriam to answer that question because Miriam is absolutely the expert on this. So I think it would be lovely, Miriam, if you could uh, take well, I, that one. I will, I will uh, ask Miriam to do that. And perhaps everyone should know that, that Miriam has been seconded to the Law Commission uh, to help them with uh, these very issues. So over to you, Miriam. Uh, that's, that's very kind of both of you. I, I feel like the pressure is certainly on now. <laughs> um, uh, yes, as, as Bernard said, the Law Commission is um, currently working on a digital assets project, um, the first part of which will uh, focus on documents of title and negotiable instruments. And the uh, the proposal for reform will will have will be done with a view to recognizing electronic documents of title and negotiable instruments. So um, certainly something to watch out for. The consultation paper should come out in the spring. Um, uh, some uh, uh, one important thing to bear in mind is that um, even though reform of English law will not necessarily mean that other countries will follow suit. Um, as, uh, as Professor Bart said, English law is chosen as the governing law for many, many of these transactions. Um, so uh, reform of English law is likely to have um, a, a significant impact, I think, on the use of these documents in electronic rather than paper form. And that's everything from me. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Miriam. Thank you. Um, now we've got another question from uh, Ritesh uh, Kaushik. Kaush I'm not sure how to pronounce the name and I hope that she'll forgive me. Um, the question is this. Currently the master is conducting all meetings 
with shore party at load and discharge terminals outside the ship's accommodation. Just in case the master gets infected with COVID owing to such meeting at load port, is the ship considered unseaworthy at load port just in case cargo gets damaged at sea? Or upon arrival discharge port, ship gets delayed due to COVID testing carried out on, on such a ship, wherein a crew member or members is or are suspectedly infected with COVID, as reported while at sea, who is to be made liable to pay the damages? Well, who's going to uh, try that? I, I think that, uh, I think it's Filippo. I mean, this is a COVID question. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ritesh. I appreciate your kind question, but this is a million dollar question. <laughs> this is what everybody is asking at the moment. Um, I, it's a difficult one, really. Uh, the first part of your question being, you know, if, if the master gets the bug uh, during one of those meetings and then sails off, is this unseaworthiness of the vessel? I personally doubt that there are, that there are a few people who actually say it is uh, or it may well be unseaworthiness. Well, well, that unseaworthiness then causative is a different matter. But um, I... I, I it's a very difficult question. I wouldn't like to to um, to answer too neatly. My personal view is that it isn't necessarily so because as long as you have procedures in place which would allow the ship to perform anyway, uh, you know, sickness on board vessels is nothing new, and as long as you have a system which allows the vessel to perform then there shouldn't be a, 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 a general default uh, of, of the contract. Um, the second bit of your question is also uh, very topical. Uh, basically, if there is the suspicion that the vessel is infected, uh, then uh, who pays for that delay? Well, that mercifully is a matter of contract. Uh, charter parties would have clauses dealing with Certainly now they have clauses dealing with, but also before they had clauses dealing with quarantine and the allocation of costs and responsibility, cases like this. So it would depend on the specific contract concern, what the uh, uh, liability profile for that uh, waste or for that loss of time uh, may be. Well, I hope that knowing Ritesh as a former student, I'm sure this will not make him happy, but at least... <laughs> It will give him some, some, uh, something to think on. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. And, and Ritesh uh, sends uh, greetings from the Southampton 2016-2017 intake. <laughs> now we have uh, um, another question from Alessandro Mifsud. Um, Lovely to hear from you all. A true maritime professor dream team is uh, the preface <laughs> to the question. And here is the question. I have a general Brexit related maritime question. Here in Malta, we have seen a massive increase of British clients bringing certain aspects of their business to Malta due to Brexit, mostly relating to yachting and ship registration. I'm curious to hear your opinion on whether the UK maritime industry will take a hit going forward as from the 1st of January 2021 post Brexit. And that's from an intake at Southampton in 2017 18 and Queen Mary 2019 2020. So that's very nice. Thank you, Alessandro. Who, who's going to have a go at that one? Um, it's a it's an industry it's an industry question. Do we think do we think that Brexit is going to have a, a deleterious effect on the UK maritime industry? 
Shall I, may I volunteer yeah. one or two thoughts? Yes, thank you. I, I can't claim to be uh, an expert on um, what's going to happen to the maritime industry, but, but I think that there are certainly, uh, as Alejandro points out, um, you know, there have been some companies moving to open in um, EU member states um, in order to protect their business. And um, I heard uh, Rob Merkin speaking recently about uh, insurance. And there's no doubt that Lloyd's have opened offices in EU member countries so that they can uh, do insurance business uh, within the European Union. However, it, it was felt that a lot of that would then be reinsured back into the London market. Um, so, yes, I think that there may be some movement of where, uh, where, for example, insurance is placed. Um, but, but as regards um, jurisdiction and the courts, which, of course, is the bit I'm particularly uh, um, interested in, although there is no doubt that there are are more questions now about what rules will be applicable in future and also questions about how we're going to enforce English judgments abroad. I don't think that as a whole that's necessarily going to affect the business coming either to the courts or if, if parties switch they may switch to London arbitration. So if, if, the, if court jurisdiction clauses, English court jurisdiction clauses lose, they may lose it to London arbitration and therefore the English market as a whole, I think is unlikely to suffer uh, on the litigation front. And then Bernard, of course, to, to pick up your point that you made right at the very beginning, it's not, just uh, it's not just court jurisdiction and arbitration. There's also, of course, the duty Mediation, mediation, etc., which is again London is a major centre for those types of dispute resolution. Yes, I, I agree with everything you've said, Yvonne. And indeed, if one thinks about the UK maritime industry, it's not so much these days. It used to be, of course, concerned with ships. I don't know that we've got so many ships left in the UK maritime industry but it is very much concerned with professional services. Uh, so Yvonne spoke about insurance, marine insurance, particularly important, um, engineering ser services um, and legal services. And I don't think myself that Brexit is, is going to be deleterious to that. And indeed, if one considers the dagger in a way which has been held uh, over the future of arbitration in the European Union by that famous case of the, uh, uh, of, of the court, um, whose name I've temporarily forgotten. Uh, I, I think that if anything, as Yvonne has already suggested, um, uh, London maritime arbitration might well get a fillip from Brexit. But anyway, predictions about the future are always very, very difficult. Now, we, we've got a, just a, a time for uh, perhaps one or two questions. There's a question from Andrea Iguera, uh, which is this, and it's directed in particular to Filippo. Will ship owners, especially container liner carriers, reclaimed in marriage charges to all the buyers that were actually unable to pick up cargoes at ports due to COVID-19 restrictions? Will cargo receivers defend themselves by relying on force majeure clause in their respective contracts of sale? Well, thank you, Andrea. Um... Good question, very topical. The, the answer to the first question really is two. The first, I would say, it depends on the owners. Some owners may well ask uh, the marriage, and actually there has been news uh, recently. A few of the owners have insisted uh, that uh, the marriage 
should be paid and they may well have the right to do so under their contracts. <clears throat> of course, if that contract um, has got a force majeure or a pandemic or an epidemic clause, then it will have to depend on what the clause says. But to answer your second question, I do not believe that uh, cargo receivers can defend themselves against the owners claiming the marriage by relying on a force majeure, which is in their sale contract, simply because they're different contracts. Um, so there may be a way in which the sale contracts contain the possibility to recover the marriage paid uh, under the, uh, the marriage paid to the ship owner under the sale contract. But in the absence of such a clause, the two contracts would be completely separate and a force majeure clause in the sale contract would not help uh, in the relationship between uh, ship owner and, uh, and, and cargo owner. All right, and, and we've got a, a, another question which may be uh, perhaps best directed to, to um, Mikis. Um, and this is from Professor Eduardo Adrania, uh, who asks if there is any development in the book about ship registration. Okay, well, um, the answer is I'm not writing the ship registration chapter, so I don't know whether there's a development in the book. What I could say about ship registration, though, is that and Brexit, because that, uh, Alessandro's question um, touched upon that, was that um, we did uh, do a study uh, together with uh, uh, Yvonne and other people at, at, um, when, when we were at Southampton on Brexit. Uh, and in this study, we did uh, look at registration and we actually thought that the effect is not likely to be important. So I, I'm a bit surprised that you, you see, you're seeing this uh, massive increase. It's good for you to have this massive increase of British clients. Uh, I wonder whether it has anything to do with, um, uh, with taxation uh, and other issues rather than to the operation of the ship register itself. Because I, I'm pretty sure that the ship registers that are offered under the the ensign, the red ensign, are quite competent and, uh, and well-respected around the world. All right. And we just have time, if we're very quick, for a question from, from uh, Wang Ning, or perhaps it should be Ning Wang, um, forgive me. Um, would the environmental improvement on the ships at sea be envisioned, be envisioned in the near future, or will it take a long period of time to see a substantial improvement? Well, I guess I guess that's for me as well. Yeah, exactly. um, uh, yes. Well, um, the environmental performance is continuous. The problem we have is that we don't know whether this improvement in environmental performance is efficient enough to stop the problem from occurring. Okay. So we, we, we are getting cleaner ships. There's no question about that. We're getting implementation, but clearly that's not confirmed as enough for protecting marine biodiversity or other activities because, or other, other, other impacts, because it is only part of, of, of human activities. It's only one part. So it's very difficult to actually say when we're going to have end results if you want, but it is supposed to be a continuing effort for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for all your questions. Thank you um, for all. Bernard, apologies to interrupt you. There was just one more question which ah. we didn't deal with. Um, it's from, it's for Professor Bartz, and it goes, uh, I understand the Hague Convention means that the chosen court cannot decline jurisdiction on grounds of, for instance, forum non-convenience. -conven um, have I got that right? And if so, do you think it's a good thing? Thank you, Miriam. Over to you, Yvonne. So, um, ju just like the EU regulation, the recast regulation, um, the Hague Convention also, there's no discretion. If a court is chosen, then that court must take jurisdiction. Um, and the, the um, 
a Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements was being negotiated at the time of the amendments to the EU regulations, which resulted in the recast regulations. So to a great extent, they dovetail. Yes, I, 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 I think it is absolutely right to say that the chosen court cannot decline jurisdiction except on very limited grounds, which are spelled out in, uh, I think it's Article 5 of the Hague Convention. Um, do I think it's a good thing that uh, the uh, court chosen cannot um, decline jurisdiction? It, and I suppose the question really is then, do, do we think that the common law rules are better because they have um, discretion and that you might be able to, to stay, for example, even though there is an English choice of court, uh, court, choice of court agreement, as the House of Lords did in Donoghue and Armco, in circumstances where there are multiple proceedings. And I think that it's where there are multiple proceedings between multiple parties that the English court is likely to refuse to enforce the English jurisdiction clause on our common law rules. So quite limited, normally we would enforce an English jurisdiction agreement, but I can see that there may be situations where the litigation is so complex that it would be unfortunate to have it chopped up into little bits with the evidence being heard all over again in London when it's already being heard in New York and the risk of irreconcilable judgments. Um, but I, I um, so yes, in my heart of hearts, I still would like to retain discretion for that sort of scenario. But you can understand when you've got a group of states all agreeing they're trying to avoid discretion because discretion introduces uh, variety and we want to have quite clear, bright lines. Um, so uh, I, I can see both the common law position, but also uh, why when you've got a multi-state um, agreement on jurisdiction, that we don't have a discretion about uh, jurisdiction clauses. Yep, yep. Well, certainty is good and discretion is good. And uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't have everything. Well, thank you very, very much indeed for your questions and your good wishes, everyone. It's really lovely to have you out there in the ether uh, <laughs> and we can go along our gallery and, and see you and it's all a delight. In, in just a, a moment, I'm going to call on, on uh, Professor Miriam Goldby to conclude proceedings and do a little, a little sum up. But just before I do that, can I, can I uh, make just one or two uh, remarks? First of all, what a, an enormous pleasure it is for me uh, to be your moderator today. Shipping law was my first uh, practice of law when I became a professional and it has always been my greatest love. It's such a romantic and interesting part of the law. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Um, and of course, since we've been discussing COVID and quarantine, it's wonderful to have Filippo from Venice, which is where the word quarantine comes from, as I understand. <laughs> so that seems to me very appropriate. So far as conflicts of law is concerned, it is work in progress, uh, as usual, but particularly because of Brexit. Um, if we're back to the Hague Convention and to common law, I don't know that we'll do all that badly, but still um, wait for more news. So far as technology is concerned, uh, it's wonderful to think that the oldest form of transport, apart, us, apart I suppose, from our own feet uh, and the horse, uh, is still doing well and is technologically uh, progressive, that is good to hear. So far as the future is concerned, well, um, I think competition is as important as regulation. They both have their place, just as certainty and discretion and flexibility have their place in the law. Uh, and so far as COVID is concerned, I think the most um, optimistic thing to say about COVID, apart from the vaccine, which is coming our way, is that it's going to create lots of disputes and no lawyers, no lawyers should be afraid 
of lots of disputes. It means that we will have lots of more jurisprudence and therefore lots of more interesting stuff to put into the sixth edition of this wonderful work. And with those remarks and my congratulations to uh, the writers of this wonderful work, let me call on um, Professor Goldby to wrap up proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bernard. And that was a, a, a wonderful sum up you've just given. So there's very, very little left for me to do. Oh dear. Um, uh, as, as we've seen from the um, respective presentations of our three speakers, um, we are very much looking at an industry in transition. And obviously, if the industry is in transition, so is the law governing that industry. So ship shipping operations are very complex. They lead to a lot of disputes. And it's in everybody's interest that those disputes are resolved speedily and with a fair process. And sadly, jurisdictional uh, um, issues simply draw out the disputes further. So certainty with regard to jurisdiction and the upholding of choice of jurisdiction uh, is, is very uh, welcome indeed. Um, uh, shipping operations also have impacts that go beyond contractual parties, um, impacts which create genuine issues of, of social justice um, and environmental protection and preservation. Um, and this, of course, uh, raises important governance questions, which Professor Simplis uh, discussed and dealt with in his presentation. Um, he also demonstrated that this impact can be mitigated through intelligent use of technology. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Professor Ricks just said, um, innovation and good use of technology, again, is to be welcomed. Um, finally, it is an industry which, as uh, Professor Lawrence on uh, showed us, uh, is susceptible to shocks, uh, to put it very mildly, um, which the law can either um, help it absorb or can actually exacerbate uh, by um, uh, uh, making unreasonable requirements. So it, it is, it is a, um, a, a a field through which we should proceed uh, carefully. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance. It was a pleasure to see you all. And uh, we'll uh, keep you posted on uh, our upcoming events. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Golby. Thank you uh, to all my marvelous panel. Thank you again to all the people who have joined us. And with that, over and out, from London to the world.